The adults have it figured out. The way you get closer to God is through hard work and toil. All of the rules are made up. No one knows what they're doing. My boss gives me too much clarity on what I should be doing. I'm a serious person, I'm responsible, and then it's telling me I'm a joker. Ooh. This definitely comes across on your Twitter account. Right? Yeah. In school, you know, using ChatGPT for your essay is considered cheating. In real life, finding a way to use AI for whatever you're doing is innovation and creativity. This is all a big game at the end of the day. And it's so nice when people approach things with sincerity rather than seriousness. In every job there is to be done, there is an element of fun. You find the fun and snap, the job's a game. Ali has been working on his first book, which is titled Feel Good Productivity. Why this book? Why this title? What does feel good productivity mean? So feel good productivity, it's like, you know, we've all been fed these narratives, right, of how productivity needs to be painful. It feels like pushing a boulder up the hill and, oh, if, if you're struggling to, do, to push the boulder up the hill, then you need more discipline or you need more willpower or you need more grit. You know, you get to the top of the hill, the boulder rolls back down and you're having to do that again and again. It's almost as if it's inherently got some kind of grindy component to it. And so really the book was an exploration or is an exploration of how do you make productivity actually feel good? Because we've all had, the, had that experience that actually the best work that we do is not when we are under conditions of stress or pain or like suffering. The best work that we tend to do tends to be when we're feeling good about it, when it feels enjoyable and energizing. And that makes us perform better. All the evidence shows that this is true. And it also makes it way more sustainable. And so this was always kind of my approach to productivity. Um, there was a, a moment when I was working full time as a doctor and I was trying to build my business and my YouTube channel on the side. Everything in life got very overwhelming. And I thought that the solution was, I just need to grind harder. I just need to be more disciplined. It's like, oh, you know, I should be more disciplined. Like when I get home from work, instead of like, you know, I'm drained of energy from my day job, but I just need more grit and willpower in order to kind of work on the business. And then it was a real sort of shift when I realized that actually, when I find ways to make my work more energizing, then it means I'm more productive in my day job as a doctor, but I also have way more energy left at the end of the day to then give to the other passions in my life, like my business or friends and family, or even just hobbies. So really the whole idea of the book is, how do we make productivity feel good? Because when we feel good, we're more productive, we're more enjoy it's, it's more enjoyable, we're more energized, and it's way more sustainable over the long term. Why does feel good productivity feel counterintuitive or like those two things don't fit? Why is like that grit, self-discipline, kind of put yourself through the struggle appealing and, yeah. and kind of is more popular? I think it's a pretty modern phenomenon that we want to feel good about our work. I think definitely a lot of the research that's been done on productivity and performance has been done, you know, several decades ago where people are working in jobs that they may not necessarily enjoy. And in those contexts, or if you're studying for exams that are not fundamentally what you enjoy, in those contexts, then yeah, you need some level of willpower and grit and discipline and, and things like that. But I think increasingly what we're seeing is that, um, you know, to be a top performer in a given field, it's, it's pretty unusual for top performers in a given field to feel as if they're suffering through their work. You know, in the 1970s, the research around the flow state came out. And when people are in flow, they're super productive, but they also feel great about it. And it feels like time is flying by in a flash and you feel, you feel really good, you feel energized at the end of it rather than completely drained. And I feel like that hasn't quite sunk into society yet. We still have this idea of like, oh, just gotta grind. And if you're procrastinating, it's because you just don't want it enough. You're not sufficiently motivated. You're not sufficiently disciplined. And you know, as much as I, I, as I love people like David Goggins, I think people like David Goggins push the narrative of like, you know, you gotta wake up at four o'clock in the morning and you gotta go out and, and suffer because if, you know, suffering is how men are made and, yeah. and you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, maybe. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a fun line from Muhammad Ali where he said something along the lines of, I suffered every day in training for 10 years and that's what it took to become a champion. And you look at that and like, okay, if you want to be, if you want to be a champion, then okay, maybe you have to suffer for 10 years. But actually for most of us, we don't want to be champions. We don't want, like, if being a champion means I have to suffer every day for 10 years, no thank you. I would much rather have a chill life where I enjoy the work that I'm doing. It's sustainable, I'm consistent, and I get time and energy to spend with other things I care about outside of work. And if that means I'm not so much of a champion as Muhammad Ali, that's totally fine. And so it's not really, the book is not really aimed at people who want gold medal at the Olympics. They're the people that would be very happy to 
be a bit more productive in their work, in their business, in their life, and who want for, for that to feel good rather than to feel as if it's such a grind. You know, it's funny, and I wonder if you could go back in time and almost do micro inter interviews of Muhammad Ali. I doubt it was 100% suffering. Like I think of when I go go and work out, there are different moments of a little bit of suffering and pain interspersed with moments of great joy, pleasure, or triumph or achievement. And those things are completely mixed up together. It's not one extreme or the other. Initially, the, I was, the, like, the, the idea for the book was, how do we make productivity fun? Mm -hmm. And I was playing around with all these like titles around fun, but like fun does not quite capture it. Because, you know, sometimes if you're at the gym, it, it, it doesn't feel fun all the time. Like even in the work that you and I do, we're entrepreneurs, we, you know, we, we love what we do. We wouldn't say it's fun all the time because sometimes feeling good does require a bit of a push. But I think the thing to remember and what all the research says as well is that that push, it's, it's, it's kind of like a spark, but it's not the thing that's gonna fundamentally sustain feel good productivity over the long term. Yes, It's useful in those moments where we're like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna bring myself to lift that weight one more time. Yeah. And then if we can find a way to make it feel good, that's what sustains it. How did you uh, arrive at Feel Good? Could you say a little bit about why was that the central idea that you wanted to put in the title of the book? It happened pretty accidentally. It happened because when I explored the science of productivity, I came across an idea um, from a researcher called Barbara Fredrickson um, called the Broaden and Build Theory. It's a theory within, psychology, within, within positive psychology all about the power of positive emotions. Imagine in caveman times, when you're experiencing positive emotions, it's like things are good. Things are good. You're, you're, fe you're feeling chill. Your sympathetic nervous system is not in overdrive. You're able to relax. And when you're in those moments of relaxation, when there's no tiger running after you, that's when you think, huh, let me go out and explore that new thing. Let me try this new tool and see if it works. Let me be nice to my fellow cavemen and cave women to sort of develop social bonding and friendships and stuff. And that only happens when we're experiencing positive emotions. Because when we're experiencing negative emotions, when we feel stressed um, and, and when we feel bad, we're in survival mode. And that's when we contract everything, like the body contracts, we're trying to hunker down, our defenses get built up. And at that point, like we got tunnel vision. And we've all had that experience of like, when you're super stressed in something, you almost like, you, you know, you kind of see, see, see red, you, you almost forget what's in your, yeah. in your environment. You just focus on that one thing. Professor Fredrickson's theory is that positive emotions broaden and build. They, it broadens the, the, the actions that you've got access to and it builds your resources like social connections and energy and things like that. And positive emotions or positive affect with an A comes up a lot as one of the factors that drives creativity, positive emotions reduce stress, and positive emotions really bleed into every area of life. Like there's so much research from, I think, uh, Harvard psychologist Sean Acker that shows that um, people who feel good about their jobs are more likely to be successful in their jobs. And it's not the other way around. It's not that being successful makes you feel good. It's that feeling good makes you successful. And, you know, I was just playing around with this like, positive emotions, positive affect. And one day, like I was in the shower, it's like so cliche. I was thinking like, oh, what's another way of positive emotions? Like good vibes, it's like good vibes, like feel good, feel, feel good. Damn, feel good, feel good productivity. It's all about the power of positive emotions to broaden and build, to boost our energy, to reduce our stress, to make us more creative, to make us more productive and to improve our whole life. That's pretty good. And I ran it by my publishers and my editor and agent and stuff like, what, what do you think? Like, technically the science is about positive emotions. Can we call it feel good productivity? And they were like, it sounds pretty good. So we're at feel good productivity. I love that you, it's like, yeah, you like started with the science yeah. and you were kind of willing to go wherever it took you. And then you were almost surprised that, that it ended up. What I like about this is you're not saying feel good just because it feels good there's actually a reason for it. There's there's an instrumental reason. There's a utility to it. There is. It's in line with your training as a doctor. It's evidence-based, it's practical, it's provable. You arrived at this really fortunate and wonderful conclusion that you can both feel good and be productive at the same time. Yeah, and I would, I would go a step further, which is that feeling good actually makes you more productive. And this is why like companies are increasingly realizing this. So that, like companies are spending billions of dollars every year on these wellness programs for their employees to help combat burnout, to help them be more creative. And, you know, why do startups have all of this fancy, you know, ping pong tables and stuff like they, they recognize that when people, when employees feel good, they are just more creative and more productive and less stressed and less likely to burn out. And so, you know, companies have figured that out. Let's apply the same principles and use the science to apply it to our own personal lives as well. So that however kind of grindy or boring your job feels, 
there are ways that you can make it feel, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to be 100% fun all the time, but you can definitely make it feel better. Yeah. And as a result, you can be more productive and more energized and have more energy to give to the other important things in your life as well. This myth that work has to be painful, that productivity is measured by pain. Where, where do you think that comes from? Where does that, that narrative originate? It probably stems back to the Protestant work ethic um, where, you know, all of a sudden, there was this like big movement in, in the UK and the US where it was like, the way you get closer to God is through hard work and toil. And that hard work and toil was inherently like, oh, like the, the harder you're working, the, mo the, more, the more of a moral actor you are. And I think that kind of attitude, especially in the US, has like continued throughout time to the point where it's such a visible signal where, you know, if someone asks how you're doing and you say, oh, I'm busy, I'm stressed, it's a sign that like, oh wow, you must be, you must be doing a lot of things. Another part of it is that pain is quite a visible signal of, of productivity. It's like, if, if someone's actually effective, you don't really see the effect of, of like how productive or efficient or effective that they're being. But if you see them staying late hours in the office, you don't have to think too hard about it. Oh, they must be working really hard. They must be so productive that they're staying so late. And I think those sorts of narratives combined with you know, stuff around like discipline and grit and the stories we get where we're lionizing people like really struggling through stuff to get to the other side. Those sorts of stories in in the modern media and stuff, all of this I think combines to give us this like, deep-rooted belief that productivity and work has to be painful and has to feel hard. And it's almost a thing of like, you know, the, the, the second chapter in the book is about play and about approaching our work in a more of a playful spirit with a sense of playfulness. And there is that thing that like, you know, my, my mum would genuinely say to me back in the day that like, you know, at some point you've got to grow up, you've got to be an adult and that means you stop playing around. Mm. And that is such a standard thing for people to say, but they probably don't realize that like, you know, the highest performers in most fields genuinely do feel as if they're playing. Yeah. Richard Feynman won his, his Nobel prize in physics. You know, he was feeling like super burnt out. His wife had died. He was like giving up with the whole physics thing. And then one day he, he kind of saw in the Cornell cafeteria um, a plate. So a student was like chucking a plate up in the air. And he looked at the logo of the Cornell, Cornell University and it's like, huh, the, the logo is wobbling at a different like rate as the, like the radius of the plate. And then he was like, huh, let me just explore that. It's not like leading to anything, but like, let me just try and create equations that model the wobbling of the plate. And those equations ultimately led him to the equations that would win him the Nobel Prize a few years later. And he credits it to playing. I would love for the narrative to be progressed beyond the point that productivity needs to be painful. In fact, true productivity can be playful. It's the it's the stories we tell too. Like I notice even people that I, I, I know are successful in part because they're playful, they enjoy it. Sometimes in interviews, they'll say they'll say these these things, they'll create these myths of, oh, I just struggled for years and years, the Muhammad Ali quote that you said. It's almost I wonder if they actually forget. I don't know if they're doing that on purpose, they're trying to create that myth or they just forget how much they enjoyed it. But the, the stories you hear about in books and, and magazines and TV, I feel like also kind of lionize these like, you know, martyrs, these martyrs that really went through the fire and came out the other end as heroes. And then those are the people that we end up looking up to. Yeah, you tend not to hear stories about the person who just like really enjoyed what they did and found ways to make it fun and, you know, arrived home at a reasonable hour to be able to spend time with their wife and kids and you know, had a pretty good life. You, like, that does not make for a particularly compelling story. No, it doesn't. But it does make for a very good life for that person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have so many research findings, really profound insights, but then you go into what you call your strategies and experiments yeah. to really make it empirical, like test it and prove it for yourself. So I've picked out five of my favorites. Uh, the first one is the Shoshin approach. Yeah. Can you tell us what that is about? Um, so just for a bit of context, we've got nine chapters in the book. So each chapter is modeled around a single principle, um, but each principle has three strategies and each strategy has two experiments. So it's in total, there's nine principles, 27 strategies and 54 experiments. And the way that like I would encourage people to read the book is not to take my word as gospel truth, even though everything is broadly science-based. It's to treat these different things as experiments that you can apply to your own life. Kind of treat it a bit like a scientist, treat it like Richard Feynman trying to win his Nobel Prize. You know, let me just try the experiment and see how it feels. See, like, does it feel good and does it boost my productivity? And so the Shoshin approach is actually an idea from uh, Zen, uh, the Zen tradition. 
And it's basically, it's, it translates roughly to beginner's mind. And it's within the chapter called power. And so the, 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 the general principle there is when we feel a sense of power in our work, when we feel that empowerment, it makes us feel good, it makes us more productive, it makes us more creative. So how do we feel that sense of power? Well, one way of doing it is by trying to boost our, our own confidence, our own abilities at the task that we're doing. Especially when you've been doing something for a very long time, it's easy to fall into that trap of thinking that you know your stuff and you're a bit of an expert and you have nothing more left to learn. Um, but it's just like the Shoshin approach is, is the idea of being a lifelong learner, the idea of always having a beginner's mind. And I think there's a there's a fun story in in the world of Zen uh, from this like professor who goes to visit this Zen monk um, in a temple, and the professor is like, "I know all these things, and I want you to teach me more." And the monk asks the professor to fill a cup with water, and the professor's like, "All right, fine, I'm going to fill the cup with water." And the monk says that, like, if the cup is already full full of water, it cannot be filled anymore, and so he needs to kind of pour the water out, empty the cup. And then, the, and, and then the cup can be filled with the teachings. And that's like a parable that illustrates the idea of beginner's mind, like actually approaching things from a fresh perspective, having a beginner's mind. And generally, like when, we're, we're, when we fall into the trap of thinking that we are an expert on a thing or we are good at a thing, it A, stops us from learning, but B, everything starts to feel very high stakes. It's like now all of a sudden, you know, I'm not, I'm not in learning mode, I'm in performance mode. It's like, I, I must have the answers, I have to perform. And we know again from the evidence that when we feel that performance anxiety, it tends not to improve people, people's performance. It tends to reduce their performance. This is why when people are, you know, a little bit tipsy, they often perform better if you, they play sports or if they're not thinking about it. And like getting out of our own head, approaching something from a beginner's perspective is one of the strategies or one of the experiments that we can try to help our work feel better in terms of feeling more empowered. How can you on purpose cultivate a beginner's mind. It's more than just like deciding. Like, is there some environment you put yourself in to, some ritual, some kind of person you talk to, to, to kind of get yourself into that state? So I think when I, when I had the day job, um, I realized that one of the things that made work feel really good was when I felt like I was learning something. And you know, when you're a junior doctor, you've, you've spent six years at medical school, you've learned the stuff, and you're not so senior that you're actually doing the interesting things. You're like doing very basic, boring, admin-y type stuff. And what I said to myself is that, okay, even when what I'm doing is really boring, there is always something I can learn from this. Let me try and approach this as if I'm a beginner. And so when I was, when I was going through patient notes and seeing drug names, you know, of the medications that they were on, I would just ask myself, what's the mechanism of action for this drug? And this is something I learned back in medical school. It's not overly relevant, but I was approaching it as if I was like a first year medical student thinking, ooh, I'm seeing this drug, I don't know, paracetamol for the first time. I wonder how paracetamol works. And then I would try and recall it then I'd go on Wikipedia and look it up. And I'd be like, oh, and I kind of turned it into a bit of a game. And I'd have medical students with me. I'd be like, hey, do you know the, you know, the mechanism of action of like, I don't know, cell butamol or whatever the thing is. We turn it into a bit of fun. And that became a profoundly energizing, energizing source in my life where it was kind of boring. I didn't need to do it, but because I approached it as if I was like, let me imagine I'm back in first year and I'm reading about this for the first time. How might I explain this to a fellow medical student or how might I explain this to a five-year-old? that, you know, gave me that, gave me that feeling of joy, made me more productive in the job, improved my ability to do the job because now I knew more science, but also made it way more fun. I feel like this is a great kind of rationale to try new things, even, and especially if you're terrible at them. Mm. It's like, especially when you become an adult often, I think the reason it's hard to say, try some whole new skill or hobby or enter a new field is you're used to performing well. You're used to being a high performer. You know how to produce results. And then you're sort of knocked down to the first rung. And that feels really, really confronting. Um, I'll give one of my examples. I recently tried Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And my God, I have not been flat out on my back, completely exhausted, completely out of breath. And like I had just failed since I was a child. I, I forgot what that felt like. And it was incredibly humbling and confronting. But then I started to almost enjoy it, get played. Because once, once you know you're going to fail, because I would lose to anyone. I would use to a 12-year-old on the mat. Then there's nothing to lose. So I could try neat tricks, try some you know new technique that I was learning. And I actually felt way more freedom doing this completely new thing that I was awful at than, say, running my business that I was supposed to be good at. Yeah. There's so much freedom in being a beginner. Oh. Like even, even now I've been making YouTube videos for six years. I remind myself when I hit the camera, when I, when I hit record on the camera, 
you know, listen, let, let me try and approach this. Like AI, I remind myself to approach it like a beginner would. And I, I remind myself to approach it as if I'm trying to play, as if it's playful, where I'm not so concerned about failure. The stakes don't feel so high. And whenever I do that, I, I notice that like, oh, I can visibly sense my body feeling less stressed. And then that makes it feel good. The Shoshin approach is our first strategy. Uh, let's talk about number two, which is called own the process. How would you describe owning the process? Yeah, so the idea here is that when we feel ownership over a thing, whatever the thing might be, it makes it feel way more enjoyable, way more energizing, drives intrinsic motivation, i.e. the motivation we have to do things for their own sake rather than because someone else is telling us to. And this is why, you know, we love decorating our bedrooms when we're kids. It's why we love designing our houses when, when, when we're adults. We don't like being micromanaged. And so the idea of owning the process is that even if you don't have pure autonomy over the outcome, over what you're being asked to do because it's your job or it's your exam or whatever the thing might be, you normally have ownership of the process by which you do the job. And so again, when I worked as a doctor, I couldn't just choose to not treat a patient because the patient's on my list, but I could change the process. I could own the process. I could think, how can I do this in a more efficient way or in a more empathetic way? How can I kind of craft my epic electronic record system so it's got keyboard shortcuts so I can be a little bit more, more efficient? And owning the process behind it, rather than just blindly following what the previous doctors before me did, thinking, hmm, is this actually the right way to do this? I know what the outcome is that I want, but how can I take ownership over the process? And I found that again, the more I did that, the more like, even though it didn't really change anything about the job, it made me feel really good. And I had way more energy. And that definitely translated into the way that I approached my patients. What do you think is hard about that? What keeps people as they're following a process from noticing or seeing the ways in which they could customize it, tweak it, tune it to, to make it more fun or interesting or whatever? Un unless it's something someone's used to, I, I th there's, there's this idea that I think, especially when people first enter the workplace, they think that, you know, the adults have it figured out. Like, of course the manager knows the right way of doing this thing. Of course, you know, the, you know I have to follow the rules. I have to follow the SOP. Of course, of course I've got to do that. <laughs> and usually people realize sometimes very late on in their careers that all of the rules are made up. Yeah. All the processes are made up. No one knows what they're doing. Every single company, even probably Apple, which does a really good job of appearing put together on the surface, it's all just duct tape and stuff yes. behind the scenes, every single business in the world. And so when you realize that, you realize that every, everything in life is just a series of like duct tapes and like trying to cobble these things together, some of which are like 10 years old, some of which are like new, and so you have to cobble it all together. When you realize that, you realize, oh, hang on. Okay, I know what needs to be done. Let me actually just engage brain and genuinely apply my creativity to see if I can do it better. Whereas I think the assumption, especially you know, in school, we're trained to be cogs in a machine. In school, owning the process and like, you know, using ChatGPT for your essay is considered cheating. Uh, in real life, finding a way to use AI for whatever you're doing yeah. is innovation and creativity. <laughs> so the way we get trained in, trained in school is to follow orders. Yeah. Whereas this is completely the opposite of how you succeed in the workplace and how you, you know, boost your productivity. It's so funny that you mentioned Apple because the, the exact example that I had in mind was when I worked at the Apple store. Oh, no way. In college in Fashion Valley, San Diego. I remember distinctly the worst part, I was I was the lowest ranking member, Mac specialist, he doesn't get any lower in terms of rank. And the worst part of the job was at the end of the day, you would go to the wall of cases, iPhone cases, and people would just destroy them. There was a pile of opened, half opened case boxes on the floor. And every day you would just like go there and like fix the ones that could be fixed, put them back, the ones that were completely destroyed, throw them away. And I just made a small change, which is on the front of each sort of row of cases, I just put an open box. I opened one box for them. So, and so they could clearly see, oh, these are all the same. This first one is open. Therefore, they don't have to go and peel the stickiness off and you know make a mess of all the other boxes. As far as I know, that was never part of any standard process. I just came up with that in the moment. And then everyone looked at me like I had come up with some new innovation or something. But if you just, like you said, I love this as a slogan, by the way, engage brain, engage brain. Doo -doo. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of just there for the noticing. Damn, I feel like last time I went into an Apple store, they they had the cases visible, the one on the front. <laughs> so maybe it's something that like they've adopted throughout the whole, <laughs> the whole ecosystem. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe it was independently yeah. discovered. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. yeah, everyone kind of realized that. Wait a minute. Yeah. Why don't we just change change up the process? Because it's it's a reasonable thing to want. You have your phone there. There's the case inside the box. You can't you know fault customers for taking that that case out, but 
there was a little bit of creativity, even in the worst part of the job of the lowest ranking member of 100 people that worked at that store, there was space for creativity. You know, it's it's so easy to, to give ourselves the narrative that, oh, I've just got to do this. Oh, it's such drudgery. Oh, God. And, you know, people think that if they disengage from their work, it will make it easier and it will mean they have to spend less energy doing it. But that's like completely not how our own energy works. It's like, yes, in theory, if you sort of half ass it and just coast, you won't use as much energy. But actually, it drains so much energy to just coast. Like anyone who feels, who feels disengaged in their job, like if you stay disengaged, it's, you're gonna feel totally drained by the end of it. But if you're gonna you engage brain, you apply a little dose of creativity. It's somewhat counterintuitive because you're putting in energy, but by putting in the energy to find a way to own the process, to find a way to take more power or approach it with a bit more play, Putting that energy in actually generates way more energy than you put in. And so you get to the end of the workday feeling energized rather than feeling drained. It's like a, it's like a combination of power and play because it does take some power, some agency. You have to like see your agency even when it feels like you have no agency. Yeah. But then how you're using that agency is not to like control or manipulate someone else or even yourself. You're using your power to put more play into it. Absolutely. There's like this, this combo thing. And all that leads to, you know, Work starts to feel good. Whenever work feels good, it generates energy, it reduces stress, it enriches your life, boosts your productivity as well. But kind of you, you kind of realize that it's not really about the productivity. Like if, if all we could do was make our work feel good so that we could be more energized, so that we could be less stressed, so that we could have more time left over for our, you know, our hobbies and passions, the productivity is a nice side effect. <laughs> Let's talk about strategy number three. Choose your character. What do you mean by choosing your character? Yeah, great. This is, this is good stuff. So this is uh, from the second chapter, which is about play. And it's about how do we approach our work in more of a playful fashion. And it turns out there's actually a bunch of research that's been done on this idea. And there is a researcher, I think he's a psychiatrist, called Stuart Brown, who founded the National Institute of Play or something in the US, uh, who kind of went through 5,000 people, like thousands and thousands of people. And he took what's called a play history he kind of delved into their childhood and asked them how they played when they were kids. And after like these thousands and thousands of data points, he, he interviewed people from like athletes, to Nobel Prize winners, to normal people, to people in prison, like just every walk of life, he asked them about their play histories. And he basically boiled it down to eight different things. And we've got like the list of eight in the book where people can look it up. And you can think of those as different characters. Um, so one of the characters, one of the play personalities as he called it, might be the storyteller. So there were certain, you know, I was, I think I vibed with the storyteller when I was a kid. I got a lot of joy out of telling stories, out of reading fiction and doing make-believe and building a fort with my brother and our friends and like pretending we were like pirates or something, even though pirates don't live in a fort. Um, and one of the very practical experiments that we can use to incorporate more, more play into our work is to actively choose a character that we're going to approach it with. So if, for example, I know that like, you know, when, when I was young, I really enjoyed telling stories. How can I approach my PowerPoint presentation or my Zoom call or my sales prep talk or whatever the thing is as if I'm a storyteller? Yeah. And it's just like, it's almost like in a, in a video game, you've got your character selection screen, you're choosing a character, a warlock or a mage or a barbarian, whatever the thing might be, you're choosing the storyteller. How would the storyteller in me approach this particular scenario? Huh, that's interesting. Maybe I could just approach it with a bit more playfulness. Maybe I could just, you know, try and figure out a three act structure of my PowerPoint presentation, even though I wouldn't normally have done that. Yeah. And so, you know, the storyteller, the kinesthete, the director, the explorer, there's a few, there's like eight of these. And honestly, it's like the Joker, there's just a case of A, identifying what play personality you vibe with most and leaning into that. But also sometimes you can just approach different tasks as if you're a different character. And that's a very easy way to apply more play to the job, however boring the job might seem otherwise have sort of used or stumbled across these many of these strategies in the past, but never made it as explicit or as clear and definitely not as research backed as you have. So I loved recognizing, I didn't have to go and start from zero and just try like number one, number two, number three. I could almost understand my own history or play history through the more kind of rigorous lens that you provided. Um, and it brought to mind a story where I once took, you know, one of these personality quizzes that proliferate on the internet. It was like, who is your archetype or who is your, something like that. Uh, and I still remember that the persona it gave me was the jester, which is like the Joker. Yeah. And at the time I was so offended because I was like, I'm a serious person, I'm responsible. 
you know, I'm, I'm hardworking, all these things, and then it's telling me I'm a joker. But that actually unlocked something for me because there is an element, it's kind of like a repressed subconscious element of my personality, which I've since brought to the surface, which is being contrarian. Ooh. This definitely comes across on your Twitter account. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so my, yes, my Twitter account is where I let the jester just, I just let it rip. It's like always just poking fun, teasing. It's not that I had to invent that personality. He was there. Yeah. I just had to like accept him, welcome him, and allow that to come to the surface. Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that. Like, cause like honestly, like during, during the pandemic, I think, well actually no, just pre-pandemic, 2019, when I discovered your stuff, you know, I followed you on Twitter initially. And the thing that made me most vibe with your stuff is how you had that little dose of uh, irreverence. <laughs> you didn't take it too seriously. And I was like, oh, this guy's a productivity guru. He's got, got this expensive ass course on like how to take notes and stuff, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. I like this guy. And that was, it was that persona that got me into your work. Amazing. And you know, I guess it's one of those things where when you approach it with play, it just becomes more productive. And I imagine like many of the thousands of people who you know, follow you and take the course, kind of vibe with the fact that you don't take it so seriously. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it helps me not take myself too seriously, which makes it fun, yeah. makes it pleasurable, makes it um, sustainable. It's like, no, it's, it's almost like a lesson in here is you are not one person. You are not one kind of person. You, what's that quote? Uh, you contain multitudes yeah. and you're just saying, those multitudes are good, they're healthy, they're productive. You can be many things at the same time. And I think as well, just on this, on this idea of seriousness, um, there's another strategy, uh, another experiment that we, that we, we talk about in, in the play chapter, which is a quote from Alan Watts. So he was a British philosopher who um, was, you know, the guy who introduced um, a lot of Eastern philosophy and like Zen Buddhism to the West, because um, he trained in Japan and things like that. And one of the things that he famously said was that um, the angels fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> and he would like to, you know, draw, draw this contrast between being serious and being sincere. And no one wants to play a game with someone who takes it too seriously. And you play Monopoly with someone who takes it seriously, it's like, oh, they're like really a stickler for the rules and it's kind of boring and they drain the energy out of everyone around them. But you also don't want to play with someone who's just completely uncaring, who's just like, oh, I don't care about this, this is a pointless game. You want to play with someone who plays sincerely who's like genuinely giving, you know, put, putting their effort into it, but who recognizes that, hey, this is all a big game at the end of the day. And it's so nice when people approach things with sincerity rather than seriousness. And I find that whenever I'm finding work becoming stressful, or like feeling like the stakes are mounting and like, oh, this book is a big deal. It's a book and, and it has to be good. I'm just like, you know what, take a breath, dial down the seriousness. Like, let me approach it with sincerity rather than seriousness. And then I can allow play to flourish within my work. Which of the eight characters these days do you find yourself cultivating or kind of trying to develop? Yeah, so the one, the one that I vibe most with these days is the explorer. And the way that I tangibly do this is, you know, there's, there's this idea from, you know, you, you're a productivity guy, you know, that, that famous idea of eat that frog from Brian Tracy, where you kind of, or, you know, I think in Harvard, Harvard Business School, they call it the MIT, the most important task of the day. It's like you start the day thinking, what is the most important thing? And, that's fine, that's actually a really good productivity tip. Just like, what is the one thing I have to do today? Um, but I like to phrase that slightly differently. I ask myself, what is today's adventure going to be? Mm. And phrase it like an adventure. And it's just, there's just something about phrasing it as if it's an adventure that taps into the explorer side of me. So for example, today's adventure is making the edits to chapter four. And then I think, okay, it's an adventure, I'm an explorer. How would, how would I approach this as if it was genuinely an adventure? Well, I probably just wouldn't sit on my desk hunched over my laptop. I probably, you know what? It's a nice sunny day. Let's go out to a, a coffee shop or let's gonna go down to Hyde Park and sit under a tree and do the same thing. And just those little tweaks to the routine um, make me feel as if I'm genuinely exploring while at the same time being productive and being engaged and energized by my work. So I, I, I love the idea of an explorer. And I think if everyone just approached their work a little bit more like an adventure, that's a very easy way to add a, more of a sense of play into your, into your work and your life. I often notice that I'll talk to someone who's in a bad, say, work situation. They hate their job, they hate their team, or their boss, or their company, or their field, or their industry, or whatever it is. But they're enduring it for the sake of some future milestone. Until I get a promotion, until I get a raise, till I have enough savings to move jobs, till whatever. But then you talk to them six months later, <laughs> and they're still doing that. So how do you know, say someone watching this, how do they know 
whether they should quit whatever the current situation is because it doesn't feel good, or whether it's that kind of discomfort that's worth going through in, in order to, to reach something. I don't try and address this specifically in the book because I didn't want to be in the business of giving life advice. I'm just like, experiments. Um, but in the final chapter, we do talk about this. And I think the way that I would approach this and the advice I've, I've started giving to my friends is, hey, there, the science tells us all these things about how we can make work feel good. Like however bad your job is, you probably haven't done all 54 things that you could try to make it feel better. But once you have, once you've tried all 54 or however many you feel comfortable doing it and you still hate it, at that point, it's worth considering, is continuing to do this actually aligned with the future that I want for myself? And the final chapter of the book is called Align. And it's about, you know, fundamentally the way that we, you know, one, one really common way in which we feel burnt out over time is when what we're doing right now is misaligned with what we intrinsically want and value. And so most people, if you ask them, hey, what do you intrinsically value? What are your goals? Like, we don't really know. And so that final chapter of the book does encourage, you know, there's a few exercises that encourages people to really take a step back and think, what do I actually want my life to look like? And then you can run alignment experiments. You can nudge your life more towards what might feel more enjoyable. So for example, I've got friends who are in management consulting where every six months there's a bonus and they keep themselves doing the thing because there's a bonus six months from now. And so one potential alignment experiment is, you know what, I'm gonna take a week off work because it's not that hard to request a week of annual leave. And I'm gonna speak to other people who I know who are working in startup land because I like the idea of maybe joining a startup. I haven't really tried it. Let me run an experiment and see if that's actually more aligned with what I intrinsically value and want. Strategy number four. It's called the magic post-it note. Oh, the magic post-it note. The editor was not keen to call it the magic post-it note. It was like, but I, I love the magic post-it note. Uh, basically there was a there was a time during I think it was during, yeah, it was, it, was, it was during the pandemic. This was when I was still working as a doctor. And um, me and my housemate, Sheen, decided randomly to watch Mary Poppins because, you know, just like nostalgia and stuff. So we put it on the Apple TV. And um, that song came on, uh, A Spoonful of Sugar. And, you know, I knew the chorus, like, A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine better. And, but there's a, a preamble to the chorus where Mary Poppins says, um, you know, the, the, the context is that she's, you know, this magical, nanny who's trying to get the kids to do their chores that they don't want to do and she says that in every job there is to be done there is an element of fun you find the fun and snap the job's a game and this idea of like find the fun it's like find the fun it's like you can find the fun in anything it's like that really stuck with me and so that evening i wrote on i wrote in sharpie on a post-it note um you know the, the the there was a phrase in the back of my mind like tim ferris talks about this like what would it look like if it were easy and i thought i'd you know what let me write my own version of that what would this look like if it were fun? I wrote that on a post-it note, stuck it on my computer monitor, and then I forgot about it. And then the next day I went to work and it was like grim because it was COVID and everyone's like dying and stuff. And I came back home and I was like, right, sat at my desk. And I saw that note on the post-it, on the monitor. Well, what would this look like if it were fun? And I was just about to sit down to edit a YouTube video. And I thought, hmm, what would this look like if it were fun? And even just asking myself that question, like profoundly just like changed my whole like, being physiology, energy, like whatever esoteric word you want to use for that. And I just suddenly felt like, yeah, if this were fun, well, I'd have some music on in the background. Like, you know, I asked Alexa to play some Lord of the Rings. If this were fun, I'd probably uh, treat myself to a bite of my takeaway, every kind of frame or whatever, every every section of the video that I was, I was editing. Um, I probably wouldn't be so focused on the video. I'd probably also you know, be chill about like calling my mom or something like that. And I just did a few different things, just like a few subtle tweaks to my routine that evening. And I realized that, oh, actually, this was quite fun. And I did get more energy out of this than I normally would. And so I've had that post-it note or a variation of it on my on my computer monitor for the last like four years now. I always just like stick it on. And then after a while, the post-it note disappears and I write it again and stick it on again. And, you know, my cousin one time came to my house and she's, she's a bit like self-help skeptic. You know, she sees all the books in the house of like bootstrap your life and things like that. She's like, what the hell is this guy? <laughs> and she saw that note on the monitor and she was like, oh, it's kind of cute. And she applied it to her work that evening. She was applying for some jobs or some grants or something. She was like, you know what? Actually asking myself, what would this look like if it were fun? Genuinely made a difference and made it feel more fun. And it feels so, so bizarre and it's just like too simple. But genuinely, we don't ask that question of ourselves often enough. What would this look like if it were fun? If it were fun, how would it change your approach? And it's one of those things that really helps contribute to that feeling of play and therefore the feeling of feel-good productivity that we get from our work. Yeah, this is 
This, I've had a similar experience. I, I had a coach <clears throat> who had a version of this. He would say, how could you make it, he would put a number to it basically. How could you make this 10% more pleasurable? Ooh, nice. Right? Which is so, so achievable, 10%, that's nothing. That could just be like shifting, noticing that my back hurts a little and shifting in my chair. Yeah. There's 10%, oh. And you know, like your examples earlier, get a, another cup of coffee, another 10%. And then you start stacking these 10% and soon you've made it double the pleasure, yep. twice as pleasurable. It's, a, it's an unreasonably effective question, kind of question to ask yourself. Mm. Um, why do you think that is? What's the, either the research or your own experience, like what makes such a simple question you ask yourself so effective? This is, you know, this is where kind of the law of attraction and all that kind of stuff comes in, like manifestation and things. But like the science behind that, you know, I've interviewed a couple of people who are experts on this on my podcast. The science behind that is, is, is nothing mystical about energy or anything. It's just that when you create an intention in your mind, your mind then pays more attention to that thing. Like back when I was buying a Tesla, suddenly I started seeing Teslas everywhere on the road. <laughs> so it's like, I'm looking out for the Tesla. And so just planting that thought, what would this look like if it were fun? It just means that almost by default, you'll find ways to make it 10% more pleasurable. Um, by asking myself that question, like I was like, you know what? Let me take my Bluetooth speaker and just take it, put it in my bag and take it to work. And so when I was hanging out in the doctor's office, like sweating, just typing out discharge papers and stuff, I'd, I'd like strap this Bluetooth speaker onto the, the light on the ceiling and just connect it to my phone and just play some, play some Harry Potter in the background. I would like the Harry Potter soundtrack. And it just immediately made the whole environment in the doctor's office just like way more playful, way more fun. Like it was a nice little source of sunshine in the otherwise fairly grim pandemic times. And just, just from asking a simple question, how could you make this a little bit more fun? We have a two and a half year old, uh, maybe about six to nine months ago, uh, his bedtime routine started to get really heavy. And I think I had read some parenting book that was like, the bedtime routine needs to be exactly the same. You're creating like cues and getting them ready to be tired. And so I sort of rigidly followed, like down to like the timing and every step in the right order. And Caillou, our son rebelled, he didn't like it. And I just, I think I just asked a version of, of this question to myself and I realized, you know what it was? I saw, I think on social media, someone said, the bedtime routine can be an opportunity for bonding. Mm. not just you trying to get your kid to comply with you. And I saw that and I was like, oh, I've been gritting my teeth and enduring bedtime as if it's some like sworn duty that I have to plow through. Mm. When in fact, it's part of the small amount of time that we have one-on-one -on -one each day. And so I started just looking for one way each night I could do a, a little bit differently. So like brushing the, the, the kind of crux, the hardest part of the bedtime routine is brushing his teeth. So when you start to think, how many different ways can I brush a two-year-old's teeth? You know, do it upside down, have him do it, have him while standing up on the counter. One night he would brush my teeth. Like you start generating possibilities and now it's been months and we're still not out of ideas. And he actually, I don't know if he looks forward to brushing his teeth, but he knows at least there's gonna be some play and an inventiveness and he's gonna feel some connection to me and I'm gonna feel some connection to him. Think about the time spent, an hour virtually every day for the next at least few years is now playful and fun instead of, you know, painful. One thing that I've started to get better at is recognizing when anything I do when I have that feeling of grindiness or like the gritting teeth of like, oh, I've just got to get through this. It's like, whenever I have that thought, I'm like, nah, come on. You know, all the spiritual teachings, you live in the present moment, all that kind of stuff. It's just like, how can I make this a little bit more pleasurable? How can I make it a little bit more fun? And even if it's filling tax, filing taxes, even if it's going through our monthly management accounts, there's always ways to make it a little bit more fun. It's not that hard. It just takes a little bit of ingenuity. Yeah. And just asking ourselves that question, I find that just really helps. Over communicate the good. What does it mean? Why is it important to, or why is it useful to over communicate the good? Yeah, so this is in the third chapter, which is people. Um, so it's power play and people. Those are the first three kind of energizers that if we apply these three P's to our work, it makes it feel feel good. Um, and the people one is, I think, you know, at, at, at this, on, in, on some levels it's obvious, but on some levels it's not very obvious at all because it's kind of common sense, but common sense is not common practice. And there are, you know, the, I, I, I interviewed a psychology professor on my podcast, Vanessa Bones, who's written a book about essentially communication. And all of her research basically shows that we, when we think that we are communicating, we tend to be under communicating. Like no one in a relationship ever says, oh man, 
We over communicate so much. It's like, it's always, it's always a problem with under communication. No one in the workplace ever says, oh, you know, my, my boss gives me too much clarity on what I should be doing. <laughs> it's always a problem with under communication. No one says, oh, I feel too appreciated in my marriage or in my, you know, work or in my life. It's always under appreciation. And so one of the strategies in the book, one of the key strategies is over communication. When we think we are over communicating, that is when we are probably communicating at a reasonable amount. And one very easy way to generate more energy from whatever work we're doing is to over communicate the good stuff, like actively praise people. We tend not to do it because it feels weird. And we tend to think that people would judge us for doing it. We tend not to give compliments. We don't, oh, I, don't want to, uh, I don't want that person to think it's weird. It's like, it, feel, it feels awkward to say something nice. But even, even now, for example, like I'm having so much fun in this conversation. This is a really engaging interview. You're a fantastic interviewer. You've got the team around you. I would be thinking that, but I wouldn't think to say it to you because it's a bit weird. But actually saying it makes me feel good because I've shared joy. Saying it hopefully makes you feel good. Like, yeah, it does. I'm doing well. <laughs> Everyone likes a bit of validation every now and then. Like, yeah, you're doing a good job. And we just don't do that enough. And the more of this we can do, like, I think it just leads to this snowball effect of every, everything in our work and life becomes more energizing and enjoyable if we just do a better job of over communicating the good stuff. You talk about in the book um, how this has manifested in your business. Yeah. Do you want to say more about that? <laughs> so, you know, we did a whole thing with a CEO coach trying to figure out our core values in the business. And one of our core values is over communicate. And now we literally have like, we have uh, every week in our all hands meeting, everyone on the team goes around and they share, you know, a personal and professional win and a value shout out, like shouting out someone on the team for, you know, one of the values that they upheld. And often over communication is, is the one. It's like, oh, thank you to Becky for over communicating her strategy for social media. Thank you for, thank you to Angus for over communicating his feelings about this work that I was doing. And we're trying to make this idea of over communicate such a standard part of our vocabulary um, that, you know, it'll hopefully encourage just a little bit <laughs> better level of communication. And even then it's still a struggle. Like, you know, in my relationship, in my life, with my family, with my mom, with my work, I just always under communicate. And I think I'm communicating an appropriate amount. But if I dialed it up and was like, have I over communicated to my girlfriend how much I love her? Probably not. I should probably just message her. And then she'll feel good, I'll feel good. Everyone feels good when we over communicate the good things. Yeah, this makes me think of the um, the idea of love languages. Uh, I've had to learn very much the same lesson as you just described. And I think it has to do, this is at least my self-diagnosis, my love language, the way that I express love and appreciation just naturally is actions. I do things for people, I'm helpful. Mm. And I almost had this, I, I realized at some point I had this judgment of words. Like, oh, words are just words. That's just, that's cheap. That's no cost. They're empty, it doesn't mean anything. But this is what, where I really learned from my wife, Lauren. Her, her ability to acknowledge, she has like an acknowledgement superpower. Everywhere she goes, just as just the way she is, she's constantly just like deeply in such a heartfelt, meaningful way, acknowledging people for even the smallest little act of thoughtfulness or whatever that they're doing. And just, sort of almost being on the sidelines, watching her do this and seeing the impact it has on people mm. every single time. I'm just, I can't even believe it. It's, it's like they're starving and she's giving them a glass of cold water in the desert. <laughs> yeah. I honestly, I think everyone is starved, starved of appreciation and acknowledgement. And the people that can provide that in over communicating the good, they feel great about themselves, but they also make the other people feel great. And it's just uplifting to everyone. So Ali, um, I've been a longtime fan and viewer of your YouTube channel. I've watched dozens, if not hundreds of your videos. What did you find you were able to communicate or convey in a written book form that doesn't come across or doesn't really work in, in a YouTube video format? I think one of the things I've really liked about having the book form to communicate is because I can take my time with it. Like with videos, it's like we're on a weekly upload schedule trying to make one or two or three videos a week. And so really the way you do that, the only way to make it sustainable is eight, to feel good. But secondly, to just mine the surface level insights from my own experience. And if, you know, I, 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 re I really want to do videos where I go in depth and research and like speak to academics and read like 18 research papers and then synthesize and summarize, but that would take forever. And you know, it's YouTube. We've got to play the algorithm game and worry about retention and like, et cetera, et cetera. But with a book, 
It's like, wow, like literally four to six hours a day for the last two and a half years, I've been deep in scientific research and speaking to academics and thinking about all of these concepts and trying to structure them in a way that makes sense. And so there's very little of what I talk about in the book that's actually in YouTube videos for that reason. And so if someone wants to, you know, I think this is the value of a book. You know, some people say that, oh, you can summarize a book as a blog post. Actually, it's very hard to summarize a book as a blog post. You could, I suppose, look at the table of contents and be like, okay, these are the points. But as I've realized that so much thought goes into a book, it's literally hundreds of hours of my life and my research team's life and like reading papers and the expertise that's, that goes with that and the interviews. That's all compiled into this thing that takes a few hours to read or listen to on Audible. I'm, I think I'm the one narrating the audiobook, so that'll be, that'll be fun. And it just goes way, way more deep, but also way more broad than a YouTube video can. And I'd, lo I'd love to be in a world where if I, if I didn't have to worry about the algorithm, I'd make maybe one YouTube video every few years. But nice. obviously that's unsustainable <laughs> in terms of the business side of things. So yeah, the book is a, the, the chance to really go, go deeper on stuff. And I hope it'll, you know, I, if, if, if I think back to my life, the things that have had the most impact on me have not been YouTube videos or podcast episodes. They've been books. They've been reading The 4-Hour Workweek or reading Austin Kleon's Show Your Work or reading Derek Sivers' Anything You Want or, you know, reading Building Second Brain. Uh, those, yeah, those. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you're reading a book and you're sitting with the ideas, you're not like incessantly being thrown editing at your face to try and sustain your retention and stuff. You can take it at your own pace. You can read a few pages each night. And it really allows the ideas to percolate and to, to, for you to apply them in your own life in a way that at least I find that videos and podcasts don't really. So that's my sales pitch for books in general. And that's why it's been so nice to be able to create this compared to the sort of weekly cadence of YouTube videos. Now take the opposite question almost. Um, how has your, your years of YouTube experience influenced the book? Like how is the book different or uh, written the way it is because of your experience on YouTube? Hmm, that's a good question. I think my experience on YouTube is that people value conversational, a conversational tone and authenticity. And so I've tried to bring the conversational tone to the book. Mm -hmm. Initially, our editor was like, when he, when he did a pass through the book, he was like, it sounds too conversational. It doesn't sound authoritative enough. And after a long, a lot of push, push, pu pushing back and forth, he came around. It's like, actually, the sort of book I want to read is not a book from like a guy who's trying to be authoritative. Unless it's like freaking Daniel Kahneman who's won a Nobel Prize. Okay, fine. <laughs> he can be authoritative in his, in his reading. But even then, yeah. I way prefer to read things from people where it sounds as if the author is speaking to me. Yeah. And that's the kind of vibe I've tried to create with a book, which I think has come from kind of the years of training in YouTube videos to try and be as conversational and as conversational as possible and to relate to the audience as much as possible. I've noticed this with you over the years that your offline and online personalities converged mm -hmm. in both directions. So like your YouTube persona became, yeah, more fluid, authentic, just off the cuff, unplanned. But then also your, in a funny way, your offline persona borrowed some uh, enthusiasm, charisma, yeah. almost stage presence from your YouTube personality. So you're really the same person. Like when I talk to you here, yeah. it's the same person I'm talking to outside. And yet you've almost, it's like that character thing where you've taken elements of two different aspects of yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's interesting that you say that. Um, most people who meet me say that like, oh, you, you're the same in real life as you are on your videos. And that's, that's quite nice for me to hear because I feel like for the videos to be sustainable over the long term, and I want to keep making YouTube videos forever, again, coming back to this idea of feel-good productivity, it shouldn't feel painful. Yeah. And I know that when I put on an act, it, there's something about that that feels painful. Yeah. Whereas when I can just tap into my own inner sense of authenticity or energy or whatever, uh, it feels a lot more effortless. Yeah. And the more effortless and enjoyable and energizing it feels, the more sustainable it becomes over time. One last question. I noticed your, this is kind of in line with what you were just saying, I noticed many of your examples or inspirations came from video games, mm. which is so such a funny thing to notice because we grew up, I mean, I played tons of video games as a kid too. We were sort of one of the first couple kind of video game generations. And what were we told? I don't know about you, but I was told constantly, waste of time, yep. your life is going down the drain, successful people aren't people who play video games, and yet, it's one of the chief sources of inspiration for a book on productivity and success and self-improvement. So how did that happen? 
<laughs> yeah, again, sort of happened accidentally. Um, I, I did not intend for this to, to be the case, and I didn't want to give the vibe that the whole book was about gamification, because I think that's, you know, got a weird, a weird history. But what I found was, as I, st as I started, again, digging more into the research around psychology and motivation, it's like video games are a really interesting case study, because you will get kids who their teachers will say they've got ADHD and they can't focus and they hate school and they're terrible people, and yet they're playing video games until three in the morning. There is something about video games and the way video games are designed that appeals so much to human psychology. And so part of the research for the book was thinking, why is it that I used to find World of Warcraft so addictive when I was younger? What do I currently love about Diablo 4? And some of those ideas around, you know, the video game designers are very clever. Like, obviously, there's a multi-billion dollar industry designed to keep people hooked. And so things like uh, power improvements and leveling up and the beginner's mind and just setting a difficulty level at the appropriate level of challenge and choosing different characters that vibe with you. And obviously the play component and the people component, all of these things, video game designers have been adding to their video games to make them more and more addictive. And you, what you get is kids who can't focus in real life can absolutely focus in video games. And so a big part of the inspiration was like, I wonder how we can apply this to our actual life. What are the principles we can learn from the design of video games to apply to our, our genuine work so that it's easier to focus, so that it doesn't feel as if work is painful and it feels more like work is playful. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard some people say, oh, it's because video games are just endlessly stimulating, which there's definitely some truth to that. But then also some of the time, a lot of the time, if you actually look at what you're doing in the video game, it's kind of like work. Mm -hmm. Like my big, my big game that I was into back in the day was StarCraft. And it's just like, I would look at, I would sometimes wake up in the morning in my pajamas, play the whole day, and then just go to sleep again, wearing the same pajamas, like wouldn't even change. And what I, what I was doing was like stockpiling minerals. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like mining. And so I don't think you can explain and, uh, explain away the, the appeal, the power of video games just with, oh, it's just like endless novelty and, and, and stimulation. It's that I s constantly saw the reward of yeah. my efforts. Yeah. There was such a clear, I never went backwards, or if I did, there was a reason. It was like, I knew what improvement meant. I knew, knew what I was trying to do. I was trying to win the battle. And therefore, I was really, in a sense, addicted to improvement and achievement. That was like my first taste of achievement when I was in fifth grade and didn't have any other way, really, to achieve in my life. Yeah. What was your game? Uh, World of Warcraft, back in the day. Um, I think the sense of progress. We were thinking of adding a fourth chapter to, to the first thing, like the fourth P, progress. Awesome. Power play people progress. Uh, we ended up sort of cutting it and like weaving that into power and similar stuff. But there is something so addictive about the sense of progress in literally anything. Um, one of the one of the ways I make the gym enjoyable for myself is to track my numbers because it feels like I'm making progress. Progressive over it feels like progress. It feels good. It's almost like a leveling up bar in, in a video game. Um, I had an, I did a great interview with Brandon Sanderson, who's my favorite author. You know, fant fantasy fiction books. He writes at a ridiculously productive level and he tracks his word count. And he finds that like, yeah, I see the bar going up and the word count's going up and then I hit my 4,000 words for the day and then I'm done and then I play video games. And he oh writes the best gosh. books I've ever read. So it's like, the, you see this progress principle. I think there's actually a book by that title. This progress principle come up so much. And I think that's one of the key things that video games are tapping into. Um, I kind of feel like you've created, I almost think of going along the science theme, like the periodic table of productivity. You know, many of these individual tips or recommendations will be familiar, people have heard before, but what you're doing is putting them in a framework, almost like a diagnostic framework, or like you can just like look up, okay, what am I missing? Play, follow the index, or look up the element on the table that you're missing, and then just like put a little bit of that. So it's, it's not just this like random collection of tips and tricks, which so many productivity books are, it's really the scientific method, but made more practical and personal because the the filter through which all that you know testing and experimentation goes through is what feels good. Yeah, that's kind of the ultimate authority in the realm of personal productivity, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just you know a series of experiments that people can try out with what I hope is a sensible three-part framework behind it. And for some people, some experiments will make them feel good and make them more productive. For other people, they're not going to vibe with I don't know the choose your character or whatever the thing might be. That's totally fine. And I think really productivity is deeply personal. It's not just a thing that like corporations kind of are sort of working to improve productivity. It's like a deeply personal thing for all of us. And you know, productivity is just using your time well. Yeah. 
And whether that's for your work or your business or your side hustle or your guitar playing hobby or raising your kids or spending time with your family, if you can use that time well, then you're using your life well and you're not gonna live you know, the, and then you won't die with regret for how you've wasted, wasted away your life. And I think if we can try and find a way to make it feel good along the way, we're just you know winning on, uh, across, across all fronts. Thank you. This has been wonderful. You can pick up the book, Feel Good Productivity at feelgoodproductivity.com. And I encourage you to, it's been great having you. Thank you so much. <laughs>